Welcome to Lecture 7, Word Formation and Lexis of Middle High German. First, uh, some basic concepts of Middle High German word formation. After dealing with inflection morphology in the last session, which is the type of morphology that produces word forms, today's topic is word formation, the system of forming word stems. Since word formation constantly produces new lexical material, it makes sense to take a look at the same time at selective sub-areas of Middle High German lexis. For the classification of word formation patterns in German, an approach based on the distinction between the two most important word formation types in German, compounding and derivation, has proven useful. In principle, all the types of word formation present in contemporary German are also present in the older language stages. Differences exist in the functional weight of individual processes and how these, those processes are carried out. In the field of compounding, a distinction between two forms can be made. The first are copulative compounds made between compounds of equal constituents, such as Maid, Mutter, Virgin and Mother, attested in Priester Werner's Maria from the early 13th century. Der Maid Muotter gemühetes, du und in Riecher freuwede, durch des Kindes bescheuwede. The other type is the determinative compound, where there is a dependent relationship between the constituents. These can also be subdivided according to their semantics. Androcentric determinative compounds determine a part of what is denoted by the root word, a free weep is a weep, whereas this is not the case with exocentric determinative compounds. A bottenbrot, for example, is not a loaf of bread, but denotes a messenger's wages uses metonymic transfer. So-called possessive or bahuvrihi compounds are types of exocentric determinative compounds and usually designate persons via their pro properties. Uh, the narrator of Helmbrecht uses terms like these to refer to certain robber barons, like Wolfes Gaume, actually a person who has a wolf's throat, or Wolfes Drüssel, actually someone who has a wolf's snout. Phrasal conversions are a special case in the field of compounding. Uh, compounds uh, that preserve traces of syntactic structures. Such, for, such formations are relatively rare, but the narrator of Helmbrecht again uses this procedure to form names of other robber barons. Lamberslind, Lamberslind, Lampslayer, Slickenwidder, Swallow the Ram, Rüttelschrien, Shake the Box, and Mischenkech, Smash the Chalice. Das ist mein Geselle Lamberslind, und Slickenwidder die Zwene sind, von denen ich hahn diese Lehre. Noch nenne ich dir Meere, helle Sack und Rüttel schrien, das sind die Schulmeistermien, Kühe, Fraß und Mischenkelch. In the field of derivation, a distinction is made between explicit derivation with the use of affixes and other cases. In explicit derivation, a base, usually a basic morpheme, is transformed into a new word by adding a prefix, suffix or circumfix. The part of speech of the base may remain unchanged, as in the case of ungetrüve, treacherous, which was created by prefixing getrüve, loyal, with un, with un. In the case uh, we are dealing with modific, in this case we are dealing with modification. If the part of speech of the base changes, as in the suffixation of the adjective war, true, with height, which results in the noun war, height, truth, we are dealing with transformation. Explicit derivation, explicit derivation is different to implicit derivation and conversion. Finally, synthetic compounding is characterized by the formation we see in Ebrecher adulterer. The elements of the basic syntagm du Ebrechen to commit adultery are joined together by suffixing with er to form Ebrecher adulterer. Des ist mehrere Rauber und Wucherer, Diebe, Morder, Abbrecher, Lügener, Trügener, Ebrecher, denn wie der Zieht und wie den Jahren, do getrübe und wohlgezogen waren, unser Alten, die er nur sind, verfahren. Ebrecher is not a compound because the second element 
Brecher is not attested as an independent lexeme in Middle High German. Having surveyed Middle High German word formation patterns, let us now take a diachronic look at some areas of verbal and nominal word formation where the Middle High German system shows a marked difference from Old High German. Word formation in contemporary German verbs is dominated by derivations, namely prefix and preverb formations. Prefix formations are used in the case of inseparable prefixes such as bestehen, sie besteht den Test, and preverb formations in the case of separable prefixes such as aufstehen, sie steht vom Tisch auf. In contrast, suffixation is marginal for verbal derivation in modern German. Looking at word formation in the history of German, this was not always the case, and Middle High German is essentially responsible for the present state of affairs. In Old High German, there was still functional method for deriving words using suffixes. Let us briefly recap the inflection of the Old High German weak verbs. There are three classes distinguished with different vocalism in the suffix. The suffixes in the case of the en and on verbs are still present in Old High German, while the Germanic jan suffix occurs only in a modified form or disappears entirely. But one factor is crucial. The suffixes en, on, and with restrictions jan are recognizable as derivational suffixes in Old High German because they form certain semantic classes. A large number of jan verbs are factatives or causatives. They modify the base verb to express the concept of completing an action. By adding jan, Old High German trinkan becomes, tr becomes trinken to make drink to water. Old High German liedern to move becomes lighten to make move to lead. A large number of own verbs are ornatives. They modify the base noun by adding the concept, concept to provide with. Old High German Salba ointment becomes Salbo to apply ointment to to anoint. Old High German Lo praise becomes Lobon to provide praise to praise. Finally, a large number of in verbs are incolitis. They modify an adjective or base by adding the concept of to become. Old High German Fool, Rotten becomes Fuhlen to become rotten to rot. Heil, Sane becomes Heilen to become healed or to heal. This largely functional system of verb derivation is lost with the weakening of unstressed syllables in Middle High German. The suffixes no longer differ from other infinitive endings are therefore no longer recognizable as an expression of semantically differentiated word formation patterns. With the onset of the weakening of unstressed syllables, the way is clear to foreground prefixation in German verb formation. In late Old High German, which as we have seen was already which as we have seen was already subject to the weakening of unstressed syllables to some extent this restructuring is already noticeable in addition to the original suffix formation such as the factative jan verb swenden to make something disappear or the incoative en verb blinden to go blind there was a development of prefix variants such as verswenden or irblinden The appearance of these suggests that the suffixes were no longer transparent by this point in time. Middle High German then finally eliminates the prefixless variants and extends the process to cases that neither belong to the Old High German factatives nor to the Old High German incolatives. The functions of the old suffix system were thus taken over by a new system of verbal prefixation. The system of Middle High German verbal prefixation is fully functional, but also new and thus potentially endangered in its integrity. This may explain a striking difference between Middle High German and contemporary verb derivation. When reading Middle High German texts, one encounters several passages like the following. Der Herr den Gürtel abeband, or sie abbrechen den Kelch, or even Lechelin dienen Fürsten aberfach zwei Land. From a contrastive point of view, the common features between these passages are the formations with an inseparable prefix, where in the present language there should be formations with a separable prefix. These specific observations are an indication of a general trend. Verb prefixes are initially prototypically inseparable in Middle High German. 
a trend that only begins to develop in early New High German, more precisely around 1500, in the direction of the prototypical distribution for verb derivation in the modern language. In today's system, over 70% of verbal prefixes are separable. The Middle High German situation can possibly, possibly be explained by two assumptions. One, inseparable prefixes are the more typical affixes because most other affixes are also inseparable. Two, inseparable prefixes are better affixes because they better ensure the integrity of the newly formed ver words as continuous phonetic strings. The further the word formation pattern is integrated, the less important this criterion is. Overall, however, it can be said that prefix formations have become a trademark of verbal word formation in Germanic since Middle High German. Compared to the new methods of prefixation, verbal suffixation in Middle High German falls ever more to the wayside, but without being as marginal as in the contemporary language. Less than 10% of word formation in Middle High German takes place with explicit suffixes, the inventory of which also remains relatively restricted. Of particular interest, however, is the loan suffix ihren. Formations based on ihren account for at least 20% of the verbal suffix formations in Middle High German. The suffix came into German in two stages, so to speak. The, oop, the older group of ihren formations contains lexemes that were borrowed from late or church Latin, e.g. disputieren, glorieren or absolvieren. The younger group includes borrowings from Old French, which came into German as part of the courtly relations we discussed previously. The formations of the th second group can be differentiated according to their motivation. In cases like Middle High German schumfieren from Old French deconfier to destroy, put enemies to flight, defeat, it is probably the lexicalized formation that was borrowed. Damit der Kühne und der Zage beide geschumfiert sind. The next group includes derivations in Iren whose Romance base was also borrowed into Middle High German, like Buhurdieren participate in a melee from Buhurt. Die Ritter hätten einen Sitte, da liebten sich den Frauen Mitte. Eines ist Buhurdieren genannt. Das tät ein Hoffemann mir bekannt, durch ihn fragte der Meere, wie er es genennet wäre. It is very common for Middle High German ear and formations to be created from a basic noun that has itself been borrowed. Take, for example, Rotieren from Rotte, Tjostieren from Tjost, Busunieren from Busune, etc. Finally, it is comparatively rare that the loan suffix Iren is combined with a native base. This is the case, for example, with Stolzieren, behaving proudly from Middle High German Stolz. Er ging stolzieren hin und her, recht als er ein V wurde. Word formation of noun and adjectives. The determinative compound is already a productive pattern in Old High German, both for the formation of proper nouns and common nouns, as can be shown by examining material from the Hildebrands Lied, written around 830, the oldest surviving textual witness of Germanic heroic poetry. If we take a closer look at the compounds of the Hildebrands Lied, you will see that they all represent a certain type of composition. The first constituent restricts the denotation of the second. There are no other syntactic or semantic relationships between the two constituents. In fact, uh, this is the original type of compound, which is why Jakob Grimm called it a real compound, echtes compositum. Noun plus noun results in compound. A Königreich in Old, Middle and New High German is Reich, ruled by a König. In contrast, the second type of determinative compound is not yet widespread in the Old High German period. It is based on the reanalysis of syntactic structures which led Grimm to call it unecht. We are dealing with cases such as Gotteshaus, the first constituent of which, Gottes, makes it clear that it was not originally a compound, but a nominal syntagma made up of the genitive attribute Gottes and the nucleus Haus, or Middle High German, Hus. This type of composition is attested in Middle High German, but its implementation faced certain obstacles. 
as long as Middle High German makes extensive use of the prepositive genitive attribute, the so-called Saxon genitive, sequences such as Zenes Vater Hus or Des Menschen Seele cannot be read as determinative compounds but suggest an interpretation as nominal syntagmata. The reading as a compound finally prevailed only in early New High German. Another hurdle that stands in the way of the widespread diffusion of the systematically well-established determinative compound pattern in Middle High German is the tendency to express certain meanings through syntax rather than word formation, which is particularly dominant in Middle High German literary text, as illustrated by a passage from Wolframs Billeham. Diese echte mochten Striete nicht, eh das in Gab Strietes Kleid, der mit der Stangen vor ihn streit. There are two possible readings of this passage, the first on a syntactic basis. The eight could not fight before he who fought before them with the pole gave them battle ropes. The other lexical based, word form lexical based on word formation before the poem in front of them gave them battle ropes. What are the benefits of the respective constructions? The syntactic expression has the advantage of greater clarity and greater syntactic connectivity, which, we can, which cannot be shown here uh, in detail. In comparison with the syntactic alternatives, compounds like New High German Stangenkämpfer are more economical in terms of expression, but have the disadvantage of being more ambiguous, i.e. they have several readings that can often, but not always, be resolved in the actual context where the compounds are, uh, occur. In the history of German, The tendency to delegate more and more syntax to word formation could obviously claim greater relevance than the criterion of unambiguous expression. This at least explains, in retrospect, the ambiguity of the German noun compounds, which is particularly noticeable from a comparative point of view. The compound New High German Zeitmaschine can easily be paraphrased as machine for the production of time if we think of ice machine, or instead as machine to replace time if we think of Lungenmaschine, whereas the corresponding French compound machine à remonter le temps makes it clear even without context that we are dealing with a machine made for time travel. The tendency of German to delegate more and more syntax to word formation can be interpreted as an expression of an overarching trend that is known as univerbation in word formation, word formation research. Univerbation is an extremely complex phenomenon, the effects of which extend from graphemics to syntax. Christian Lehmann defined univerbation as, quote, the syntagmatic condensation of a sequence of words recurrent in discourse into one word that affects both lexemes and grammatical formatives, unquote. We have already seen from the increase of derivatives with a separable prefix that not all developments in German are in the direction of increasing univerbation. However, the last development that we want to deal with in connection with the history of German word formation again highlights univerbation tendencies. It is about the emergence of suffixoids, i.e. elements that migrate from the lexicon into word formation. The element los is very common in contemporary German as a highly productive suffix for adjective derivation. It denotes, it denotes the absence of what is designated by its substantive base. iPhone los would be the property of someone who does not have an iPhone. The element los is less widespread than a standalone lexeme. In this capacity, it only appears in a few expressions such as was ist los, what's the matter, or in archisms, ein loses Mundwerk haben to have a quick tongue. Nonetheless, these isolated usages suggest that los can look back on the past as a full-fledged lexeme. How then do we trace its descent into the state? In Old High German, The lexeme los occurs uh, with at least six different meanings. Nevertheless, the interpretation of the only contextual evidence, Arbeo Lausa from the Hildebrandslied, shows that theoretically two readings are possible one as a suffixoid, New High German, Erbelos, deprived of S, one as a lexeme, 
Im German this Erbes gab es beraubt, deprived of inheritance. The context and the spelling were spaces strongly suggest the latter reading. Los still occurs as a lexeme in Middle High German, but its range of usages is clearly reduced from 6 to 3 when compared to Old High German. This is just one of two tendencies that make the development of the lexeme los into the suffix los plausible. The second is the increase of derivatives in los. While the number of these in Old High German is less than 40, Middle High German already has 156 formations, of which more than 80% are tested in sources before 1300. A second example of the conversion of a lexical morpheme into a word formation morpheme is the development of the noun suffix height, which is used to derive abstract adjectives such as Middle High German Schönheit, Klugheit, etc. in a still productive and contemporary language. In Gothic, Hethus, way, manner, only appears as a substantive. In Old High German, alongside a freely occurring substantive height, person, personality, shape, there is already a whole series of compounds in which height functions as a base word, such as Zagerheit, timidity. The noun height occurs only occasionally in Middle High German. Furthermore, in addition to height as a second constituent, the variant Eckheit, Ukeit, emerges, which has never stood as a free morpheme. Therefore, Middle High German Bitterkeit can only be interpreted as a derivative. In addition, the noun as a free lexeme disappears from everyday use. The freely occurring lexeme thus became a bound derivational morpheme that is both series forming and productive. Now, some examples of Middle High German lexis. It is of course impossible to give a satisfactory overview of the lexis of Middle High German in half an hour. It is more accessible to present the lexis of individual domains of knowledge, for example, legal terminology, the history of which in German is compiled in the Deutsches Rechtswörterbuch. Another domain would be the lexis of Middle High German charters before 1300, which is recorded in the Wörterbuch der Mittelhochdeutschen Urkundensprachen. Uh, If I limit myself here to a third domain, namely the lexis of high medieval courtly culture, this is because the associated sources, courtly novels or minnesang, belong to the core curriculum of medieval literary studies. Uh, again, I've tried to use as many examples as possible from uh, Werner's Helmbrecht. Uh, since the text is largely a travesty of courtly narrative, the numerous courtly keywords was must often be understood not literally, but in ironic refraction. Where appropriate, I will discuss the further semantic development of individual expressions into early New High German, New High German. To describe the change in meaning, I will use the widespread terminology of Harman, who distinguishes between procedures and results. Procedures would be metaphor, metonymy, folk, etymology and ellipsis, Our results would be widening of meaning, narrowing of meaning, pejoration of meaning, and amelioration of meaning. Hof, Hovelich, Hervisch, Hervischheit. The noble court of the European High Middle Ages is, on the one hand, a real place to which certain buildings, uh, objects, as buildings, clothes, weapons, etc., and processes, feasts, receptions, tournaments, etc., can be assigned. On the other hand, the court also stands for an immaterial social ideal, the concretization of which can be found above all in courtly literature, which propagates a kind of canon of values, Städte, Trüve, Tugend, Ehre, Zucht, or certain models of action, hohe Minne, or the compatibility of Minne and Battle. The adjectives hovelich and höfisch, derived from the noun Hof, as well as the associated abstract Höfischheit, basically combine both aspects. Under the influence of Latin curialis, curialitas, and old French courtois, courtoisie, however, the component idealizing immaterial social ideals is what prevails from the very beginning. In Werner's Helmbrecht, the aforementioned expressions are found with an entire range of meanings. The adjective hovelich can attribute elements of material culture like proper names. Here, uh, however, in an ironic refraction, since the name Wolfesdam 
false belly is exactly the opposite of a sign of elegance and sophistication. Noch habe ich einen Kompan, das nie knappe gewann einen Namen, also Hovelich. Der ist geheißen Wolfester. In addition, Hovelich can also refer to the totality of courtly ideals, as in Hamrecht's speech to his father. Vater, und werde ich geritten, ich truwe in Hovelichen Sitten, immer also wohlgenessen, sam dir zu Hove je sind gewesen. If one considers the further course of the narrative, Hamrecht's career as a robber baron and subsequent death, it is confirmed how complex the relationships are between courtly ideals and the material anchoring zu Hove at court. Hembrecht misunderstands Herbescheid as the sum of courtly objects, horse and horses and clothing, and correspondingly underestimates the transmission of immaterial courtly ideas, which, at least as the passage can be understood, would have required a presence to hover from birth. Courtly values, Städte, Tugend, Ehre, Zucht, Trüve, Milte. In order to dissuade his son from his illegitimate knightly ambitions, Heinrich's father emphasizes that orientation towards values such as Städte, constancy, Tugend, perfection, Ehre, reputation, or Zucht, good education, one should add Trüve, loyalty, and milte generosity, is more important than noble origin. Why does this need to be explicitly underscored? The, term mentioned, the terms mentioned were not originally meant universally, but were linked to the courtly social ideal and related to the aristocratic way of life. Ehre refers to the social reputation of a nobleman among his peers. Truve refers to the mutual loyalty between feudal lord and vassal that forms the cement of feudal society. Milte is a classical ruler's virtue and is based on the assumption that one must be, must be able to afford generosity. Der Vater sprach, nu glaube das, mir gefiel et Michelbass, ein Mann, der Rechte täte, und daran bliebe Städte. Wer des Geburt ein wenig las, der behagete doch der Welde Bass, dann von Königes Frucht ein Mann, der Tugend noch Ehre nie gewann. Ein frommer Mann von zwacher Art und ein Edelmann, an dem nie ward, weder Zucht noch Ehre bekannt. The concept of virtuous nobility, or Tugendadel, propagated by Helmbrecht's father, is a first step towards the social universalization of the courtly canon of values, where originally noble descent was a prerequisite for its validity, validity, respect for values such as reputation, loyalty and generosity is now a prerequisite for an ethically determined concept of nobility. The semantic shift in emphasis from the social to the ethical intensifies towards New High German and is not infrequently accompanied by a narrowing of meaning, where Middle High German Tugend still denotes the sum of all good qualities relevant at court, New High German Tugend is restricted to the sphere of morality and is almost only used in the sense of sexual abstinence. Edel The basic meaning of Middle High German Edel is noble of noble birth. In Helmbrecht, uh, the adjective is used exclusively in the sense, ein Edelritter war's mein Totte, selig sie derselbe Gotte, von dem ich so edel bin. The ethical connotation that dominates the use of New High German Edel is also attested in Middle High German, one of the earliest and best known passages in which this usage appears in a, sec is a section of the prologue to Gottfried's Tristan in which the narrator ponders his ideal audience. Although it can be assumed that Gottfried's intended audience consisted of members of the nobility, the adjective edel here does not refer to the social status determined by birth, but to inner values of the narrator, or those for whom his heart beats are edle Herzen. Ich han mir eine Unmüßigkeit der Welze Liebe für geleit und edlen Herzen seiner Hage den Herzen, den ich Herze treffe. Dienen and Dienest In medieval feudal society, Dienest originally denoted all services to which vassals were obliged to render to their feudal lords. In the aristocratic warrior societies of the early Middle Ages, 
it primarily meant military service, but this original usage remains throughout the Middle Ages and up to the present day and is accordingly also found in Wolframs Willeheim. Ein Teil seines Könne was ihm kommen und auch die hätten genommen starke Dienst von seiner Hand, an den er nicht wann trüve fand. Later, the expression is also applied to civil dependency relationships and in Sangspruchdichtung, gnomic or political poetry, it is often used to characterize the relationship between singer and patron. Ich han Herrn Otten trüve, er welle mich noch riechen, wie nahm aber er min Dienst je so trügeflichen. The most significant metaphorical transfer, at least for literary history, however, concerns the ream of courtly love, where the Herre is replaced by the Frauwe. It is characteristic of the so-called hohe Minne that Dienst takes place without the prospect of physical fulfillment, so that not infrequently the absence of loan is lamented. Mina Frauwen, was ich untertan, die ohne Lohn, minen Dienst nah. Arbeit. In the session on late Middle High German, I had already mentioned that Middle High German Arbeit usually has negative connotations and means toil, torment, physical exertion, for example in the well-known opening of the Nibelungenlied. Uns ist in alten Mähren wunders viel gesät von Helden Lugubären von großer Arbeit. In Helmbrecht, physical labor is positively valued in certain contexts, for example when the father advises his son, who is drawn to the court, to remain in the farming profession, which he tries to make palatable to him with a veritable hymn of praise to farm work in the fields. Accordingly, the term Arbeit is not used here but Buwe or Buwen, the basic meaning of which is to cultivate. So Buwe mit dem Flurge, so geniessen die genurge. Ja, wird für meine Frau von dem Buwe geschönet, meine König wird gekrönet von des Buwes Stüber. Frauwe Reap One of the most discussed cases of semantic change in German concerns the development of terms referring to female persons. In Middle High German the situation is clear at first glance. The neutral standard expression is weep, while Frauwe refers to socially higher ranking women and accordingly has a positive connotation. Then in New High German the semantic decline of the entire word field takes place. The originally neutral expression Reap experiences a deterioration in meaning, so that New High German Vibe, vibe has a negative connotation. The same development affects the originally positively connotated, connot connoted Middle High German Frauwe, which becomes the standard neutral expression New High German Frau. In Werner's Helmbrecht, the original usages are still present. When Helmbrecht greets his parents in Bohemian on his first return home, the narrator describes their perplexed reaction and refers to the non-noble mother with the standard expression Wieb. Sie sahen beide einander an, beide das Wieb und der Mann. And when Helmbrecht's father reports a little later on a long-ago visit to a noble court, he uses the positively connoted expression to refer to noble women. Die Ritter hätten einen Sitte, da lebten sich den Frauen bitte. Eines ist Burdieren genannt. The opposition between Wieb and Frauwe requires a detailed differentiation. Middle High German Wieb is conspicuously often used for wives. In Helmbrecht, this is particularly clear in the father's request to his son to enter into a marriage befitting his station. Dir bei so ein Glaube, mir du Mähre und belieb und nimm ein ehrliches Wieb. When specifically meaning wife, Middle High German weep seems to have escaped pejorization, at least partially, especially in its use in compounds. Until the 19th century, the expression Eheweib competed with Ehefrau. Uh, however, the lexical base can also be used in the sense as were, uh, uh, in the sense, for example, in Schiller's poem Hector's Abschied, teures Weib gebiete deinen Tränen, dear wife command your tears. The decline of Frau to a neutral, non state specific expression also begins as early as the 13th century. It occurs mostly when it appears as second member of compound nouns and shows a certain affinity to the concept of wife. Thus, the narrator once refers to Helmrecht's mother as 
Hausfrau, which could be rendered as either landlady or wife, probably in contrast to the father, who is addressed as Herre Wirt. Die Hausfrau sprach Herre Wirt. Wir sehen der Sinne, wir sehen der Sinne gar verwirrt. The case is clearer with a compound e frau which uh, no longer has any social connotation and can accordingly be used for wives of any origin, although not in Helmrecht, but in the roughly contemporaneous Marienleben of Walter von Rheinau from the last quarter of the 13th century. Davon den Mannig Mann viel wert seiner Ehefrauen hat gegärt. Finally, an example that does not really belong to Lexis, rather to pragmatics, namely the history of forms of address in German. Middle High German has a two-part system where proximity affects the mode of address. Different linguistic devices, primarily nouns and pronouns, are assigned depending on whether the addressee is near or far. This dual system is used in Werner's Helmbricht, It is remarkable how the alteration between proximity and distance is functionalized for the narrative. When Helmrich returns to his father's farm after his first stay at the court, the peasants, presumably because of his courtly appearance, choose the distant mode of address. Sprach das Friedieb und der Knecht, bis willkommen, Helmbrecht? Nein, sie enttaten es, entwart ihn wieder raten. Sie sprachen, jung Hermin, ihr sollt Gott willkommen sie. Only when the father has undoubtedly recognized Helmbrecht as his son does he switch to the closer form of address after being asked to open the gate. Heißt mir das Tor aufschließen, der Vater sprach, Tür und Tor, da soll tu nicht länger vor, da soll tu nicht sie länger vor. Beide gerade im Unde schrien, soll dir alles offen sein. The scene is mirrored at the end of the story when Helmrecht, blinded and maimed after an unsuccessful career as a robber baron, asks to be taken into his father's house. The father, however, uh, immediately chooses the distance mode of address and thus makes it unmistakably clear that he no longer wants to have anything to do with his son since the revocation of the proximal do is still considered the highest communicative punishment even today. Höret, wie er ihn gruerste, Deusal, Herr Blinde, gart ihr nu, Herr Blindekin. Since the latter quotation is the worst possible closing word, I will end today's session by saying that after this brief excursion into Lexis, we will return to grammar next week and look at some basic features of Middle High German syntax. Thank you very much.